Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, this morning, as many of you have checked in, you may have been hurt. You may have heard a lot of the conversation we had in preparation. In addition to being your executive director, I am also the mayor of the town of Los Gatos. Um, I do that. Uh, I guess I do that for fun and I do that as an evening job, but um, it serves a dual purpose in that both passions are being met and being served in that looking at both organizations and how we can utilize our resources, our time, our talent to really begin courageous conversations, counter racism, and look at what we can do in our personal influences to help build a community that I think all of us strive to achieve. As we at Cassie have discussed, the most, um, the last but important value that we that we place uh, value on is making a difference. So, and so many of you have an ability to touch lives for the school children and the families and the school communities that you work with and the ripple effect of being able not only to support students that are feeling trauma or feeling um, uh, you know, challenges, because of what they're facing in the world and in their community. And then hopefully together we can, you know, foster conversation so that those children continue to create conversations with their families, with their communities, and we continue this ripple effect of creating change. I am so happy to be able to introduce you to um, ING. I will let them do the proper introductions, but I've assembled this panel similar to what you'll be hearing today for elected officials in Santa Clara County. So mayors and council members for all the cities in Santa Clara County have the same training. And uh, we decided to do this uh, with a different twist for all of you. And hopefully we'll be able to replicate this with many other organizations that show interest. And so with that, I am so pleased to, um, and excited to introduce all of you to Ishak and Maha with ING and they'll begin the introduction. Great. Thank you so much um, to Mayor Mariko and to everyone for being here. My name is Ishaq Patan. I am the Bay Area Director uh, with Islamic Networks Group, which is also known as ING. Uh, I have the honor of being your facilitator this morning. So ING is a 28-year-old peace-building organization that provides education and engagement opportunities, which foster understanding of Muslims and other misunderstood groups to promote harmony among all people. And today's panel presentation will basically address the cultural competency skills needed for clinicians like you all to be effective in working with students and parents in various communities. With us, we have a discussion uh, of a panel of esteemed speakers who represent Indigenous peoples, African Americans, Asian Americans, Latinx Americans, Jewish Americans, and Muslim American communities in our country. What we'll do is um, First, we'll have uh, a presentation on the history of narrative formation and overview of bigotry and, and where it came from, followed by overviews of the current issues that are facing these various communities, along with the group activity. Uh, after the activity, which will be in breakout rooms, we'll discuss specific recommendations on how to, uh, you know, interact uh, with a in a cultural competent way and allow, allow you to also take these learnings uh, back to your communities. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started with our first um, panelist and presenter. Maha al is the founder and chief innovation officer at ING. She receives her MA in religious studies from Stanford University with a BA in political science and economics from the American University in Cairo. She's taught classes on Islam in the modern world at Santa Clara University and the University of California, Santa Cruz. So Maha, I'm going to pass it over to you. I will go ahead and share your screen. And if you want to just guide me through, guide us through the presentation, that would be great. Thank you so much, um, Eshaq. And thank you so much, Mayor, for that wonderful introduction. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, so the context of today's panel, the reason for and the background of this panel is continued racism and bigotry against the number of groups in the country that you will be hearing from today. Um, as Ashaq mentioned, they include Americans of indigenous, African, Asian, Hispanic, Latinx, Muslim, and Jewish backgrounds. 
The past few years have seen a rise in hate crimes against all population groups. In 2019, according to FBI reports, 60% of hate crimes were motivated by race and ethnicity, and nearly half were anti-Black. Half were anti-Black. 20% of hate crimes were motivated by religion, with 60% anti-Jewish and 18% anti-Muslim, Arab, and Sikh. So despite major advances, next slide, um, following the civil rights movement in the, in the, in the 1960s, and regardless of, well, how, of how well educated a person of color is, uh, or the type of profession they have, or their status in society, what we're seeing is that that person can still be racially uh, profiled, and that is the problem. Uh, next slide. Let's uh, first take a look at how we got to the present situation, because the answer to how we end racism must start with its roots in history. Like any disease or sickness, like alcoholism, domestic violence, etc., you can only cure the sickness by finding its source. So let's take a look at the source of racism. Next slide. The historical roots of racism are found in colonialism, which led to what scholars call racialization or the grouping and stratification of people by skin color. This was new at the time. This eventually leads to internalization or what we today uh, softly call implicit bias, where we've been conditioned to believe certain things about ourselves and other people that both create and ultimately seal in structural racism that we have today in the United States. Next, uh, next slide, uh, we'll take a look first at European uh, colonialism. Next slide. European colonialism begins in the 15th century or began in the 15th century with the so-called age of discovery and ended mid 20th century when most colonized nations gained independence. So colonial powers, which included Britain, France, Spain, Portugal, and the Netherlands used various justifications for colonization, including the church. So for example, Pope Alexander in his 1493 public doctrine asserted that Christians had a right to colonize, enslave, and convert not only native peoples in the Americas, but also promoted Christian domination over non-Western nations. In the United States, uh, it was the inspiration behind the idea of manifest destiny, which was a popular idea in the 19th century based on the belief that American settlers were divinely destined to expand across the continent. Next slide. When Europeans began colonizing Africa, Asia, the Middle East, the, uh, what we now know as the United States, their main motivations were access to resources, uh, spreading Christianity or evangelism, and gaining power over each other because European countries, of course, at the time were in competition. And they assert control over colonized people by defining Europeans themselves as being superior to the people that they occupy, whom they viewed as primitive, in need of civilizing, and uh, natural enemies of Christianity and Western civilizations, all false ideas, of course. So for example, non-white men were depicted during this period of time as follows. Well, they, generally they were depicted as being savage and dangerous. So for example, in, in 1776, the uh, Declaration of Independence includes a passage that reads, the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. Uh, General Robert E. Lee in 1856 justified slavery with his uh, disparaging view of Africans saying, the blacks are immeasurably better off here than in Africa, morally, physically, and socially. The painful discipline they are undergoing is necessary for their further instruction as a race and will prepare them, I hope, for better things. In 1888, President Cleveland described Chinese immigrants as an element ignorant of our constitution and laws, impossible of assimilation with our people and dangerous to our peace and welfare. Non-white women uh, were depicted in uh, similarly as, um, as backwards and oppressed or sexual objects. Next slide, Ishaq. 
Next slide after that. Uh, Non-Christian religions were depicted, of course, uh, in similar ways. Hindus uh, were, were denigrated and viewed as, as pagans who worshiped many gods. Jews were depicted as Christ killers, Buddhists as submissive people, Muslims as infidels, as warring infidels. These disparaging narratives, next slide, uh, lead to uh, further uh, justification through a process which we now call uh, racialization. Next slide. Racialization uh, refers to uh, the process by which people with a uh, certain physical similarities are assigned to racial groups. And these racial racialized uh, groups are then assigned certain attributes and placed in a hierarchy that always privileges whiteness and justifies the oppression of a subordinate group by representing it as less human. So for example, next slide, uh, examples of assigning diverse groups into nice and neat racial groups included uh, lumping together various and diverse African nations that looked similar into what we call today Blacks or, or, or Africans. Indigenous people from different tribes, hundreds uh, of tribes that uh, that existed in what we now call the United States were grouped as one category, uh, calling them American Indians. Next slide. Uh, Muslims today, uh, despite their incredible diversity and origins in 50 uh, uh, Muslim majority countries are viewed now as one group as if that's the only thing that defines them. This, this process of racialization and the placement of racial groups in a hierarchy Make, made it a lot easier to denigrate entire groups of people while always lifting up Europeans or, or, or whiteness. Next slide. Racialization is then, uh, this idea is then reinforced in culture and becomes racism when these disparaging narratives about entire groups of people merely based on the color of their skin or their religion is upheld by various sectors of society. So for example, in education, erasure happens when history is thought only from a Western perspective, thereby diminishing the stories and contributions of non-Westerners. The whole debate about ethnic studies and uh, critical race theory is really about that, about people of color wanting to present their own stories, their own narratives from their own perspectives. Uh, popular uh, culture disseminates the same narratives through the media, which generally portrays Blacks, uh, Hispanics, and Latinx people, Muslims, and others in a very negative light. And Hollywood, which often casts uh, white non-whites in very non-stereotypical, in stereotypical roles, rather. Literature is commonly written from the standpoint of white protagonists. Video games often cast marginalized groups as the enemy. The internet and social media are often used uh, to promote racist stereotypes. Uh, racial, racialization and racial hierarchies is also reinforced through government policies, both domestic and foreign. And you will hear this today from, um, uh, from, from all of our speakers. Um, next slide. This long history of racialization and the narratives and the policies it produced have impacted how we view certain groups. And this is what is called internalization. Next slide. Internalization uh, refers to the adoption of stereotypes about entire groups of people. These beliefs are often subconscious and they, may uh, they, they always produce a visceral reaction towards other groups, uh, such as viewing Muslims as terrorists, Right? fearing Blacks as dangerous, suspecting that Latinx or Hispanic people are undocumented. And what is even more harmful is that the subject group internalizes these beliefs. So they also have an inferiority uh, complex. Uh, internalization, uh, in internalizing such beliefs rather, produces unco unconscious attitudes towards these groups, which we call implicit bias, as opposed to explicit bias, which is, uh, which is concept, uh, conscious. Now, here's the interesting thing about this. Studies show that people's subconscious bias, biases can override their values, which means that even if you don't believe you're biased or racist, your subconscious can make you behave in biased or racist ways, especially in times of fear 
or stress. This explains why, for example, Muslim women in hijab like myself or Arabs speaking Arabic like myself can be pulled off planes for no other reason than the visceral reaction of passengers or pilots. And women like me who wear the hijab can tell you a lot of uh, stories about their experiences uh, while shopping, uh, you know, while boarding a plane, uh, just walking in the streets that, uh, that reflect what I just said. People react to us in visceral ways, the same way that we react to black men, the, way, the same way that we might react to Asians, uh, to Native Americans, um, and so forth. All of this, next slide, has led to structural racism, which is really the larger uh, problem. Next slide. Implicit bias contributes to structural racism by in reinforcing it through the actions of ordinary people. So we are sort of part of the problem as well. Structural racism um, imposes oppressive or negative conditions on racial or ethnic groups. So it's very difficult for any member of that group to escape the impact of racism. And, and unlike individual racism, institutionalized racism negatively affects people on a large scale. Next slide. Structural racism creates a vicious cycle which keeps certain groups excluded uh, from privileges. So minorities uh, are often uh, treated unequally in housing, uh, which impacts education, which then impacts employment, which impacts wealth, um, and sometimes it impacts domestic and foreign policies towards those groups, uh, criminal justice system and healthcare and so forth. Biased policies such as the war on drugs, the war on terror, ICE raids and deportations, and the former policy called the Muslim ban all have had adverse effects and continue to have adverse effects on these populations. Next slide. So in summary, uh, despite major civil rights, um, educational and professional advances, non-whites continue to be racially profiled. I can become the president of the United States or a senator or a house representative, and I can still be racially profiled in airports, regardless of my education or how much money I make. And that is the problem. And that's the problem that we need to confront. Right? So how do we counter all of this? Well, it starts by becoming aware of the problem, its history, and how these narratives about all of us are made up, they're not real. No one is superior over others because of the color of their skin or shade of whiteness or religion. All our prophetic traditions um, teach this, judge people by the content of their character. But until we educate people more fully about what I just introduced and why ethnic studies um, and that history is incredibly important to teach in our schools. We're going to continue to only aspire uh, to be prophetic in our actions, but not really know how to dismantle uh, the problem of racism. It really begins with us and how we view other people. Thank you. Thank you, Maha, for uh, providing that wonderful, succinct summary of hundreds of years and the history of the ways in which racism has uh, developed and then manifested over that time. Uh, we're now going to move into our um, panel section of the event, uh, which is when we will hear from panelists of various communities, including African Americans, Indigenous peoples, Asian Americans, Latinx Americans, uh, Jews and Jewish Americans and Muslim Americans. Uh, the question I have for our panelists is what should counselors know about the impact of the bigotry that Maha spoke about on your communities? And so that question is, what should counselors know about the impact of bigotry on your communities? We're going to start with Sheila Dawkins. Uh, Sheila is a social justice organizer on both the West and East Coast, who uh, primarily works in media and uh, film uh, creatives. Sheila, I'm going to spotlight you for you to take this on. Um, good morning, thank you so much for having us. Um, so I just wanna share um, that I'm really excited that you're here and that you're um, open to learning about this. This is really important, mostly as we um, are dealing with the 
new variant um, of the pandemic and there's been stress and mental challenges for um, students of color and all students. So um, some three challenges, um, a few, well, a few challenges that have specifically harmed our community um, prior to the pandemic and during the pandemic is just the um, ideal of not feeling welcomed in educational spaces and not feeling heard when we are in those spaces in terms of our voice being recognized in terms of us being seen as valuable in those spaces which is huge because then our parents don't want to engage and that influences our students and that's an ongoing cycle that can be very destructive in terms of engagement um, another issue is just going deeper into the space of trauma. Um, most young people right now um, feel very isolated and that's like double the amount for African-American students um, in terms of the issues of the summers that we just passed with um, George Floyd and the racial reckoning and the um, public lynching of him in the streets. Um, and the ideal that students are constantly being traumatized by these events of violence against um, their bodies and um, other um, community members' bodies and how that impacts them is real in terms of how they engage, how they sometimes deal with depression, PTSD, and they, um, insecurity and anxiety. And so all those um, level up to um, responses that sometimes might look like acting out to a teacher or a social worker in that space versus digging deep. And so um, one of the major challenges that that leads to is the ideal of cultural competency and um, really counselors and teachers asking the why. Why is a student doing this? Why is a student not um, engaging? Why is a student having challenges in this area? Do they get enough to eat? Are they having challenges at home? Are they facing an eviction? That's huge right now with um, with financial instability that's going on because of COVID. So all those things should hopefully um, ramp up your interests versus dim it down and um, lead you to just stay in those spaces of um, their problem versus their, them being a person of importance. Um, another issue is the issue of over-diagnosing uh, over students, mostly students of color, and, and seeing them as um, unable to learn um, at the level that they need for their um, age limit, for their, well, their age, and, um, and where they should be in terms of the educational scale, and over-diagnosing them um, as having um, developmental issues and putting them in spaces um, where they're not always, they don't always need to be and not really challenging those ideals. So someone might be diagnosed in middle school and that diagnostic, di diagnostic um, situation continue with them as they move throughout their educational experiences versus that being questioned. And someone saying, hey, they might have changed or hey, this, um, this counselor, this teacher might have come at them in a different way because of where they were. Another issue is, um, looking at the family structure, but inside of the family structure, the fact that we have a lot of foster youth who are African-American, who are in the, um, the public school system in the South Bay. And that's a huge issue because that means housing instability. That means that you really don't have, you don't feel like you have an advocate. That means that you have to advocate for yourself. You might not always have the resources that other students have. And because of all those things, you might act out or you might fall asleep in class because you don't feel like you have the support. Um, of a safe um, safe home space. So those are huge issues. And um, a last issue is sexual trafficking. It might seem um, far away from the school system, but the Bay Area is a hub for sexual trafficking. And specifically, African-American young girls are a huge part of that um, issue. And so really to look for the warning signs, like is all of a sudden this girl showing up on Zoom or showing up in a classroom, with um, new nails and new expensive Fendi bags and stuff that she would never have on her own. She doesn't have a job. So looking at the red flags and really alerting yourself to what's going on with these students, what's different about them, how are they acting, how are they responding um, in those settings. And then because you are a mandatory reporter, um, working with teachers and the whole ecosystem of that student and um, and trying to devise a way forward and then reporting so that they can have the support that they need from the system so they can get out of those unhealthy situations so they have opportunities. So those are some things that I'd like to share. Thank you so much. 
Thank you so much, uh, Sheila, for shedding light on the issues that um, counselors should be aware of, especially in relation to the African-American community um, and the local component as well. We're now gonna move on to uh, Shannon Rivers. Shannon Rivers is a member of the Akamil O'Otham Nation. He is an indigenous people's human rights activist, spiritual leader and cultural advisor. And he speaks on indigenous movements and the fight for rights of indigenous peoples. He served as a delegate and participant at the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues for nearly a decade and has served as the co-chair for the Global Indigenous Peoples Caucus at the UN. Shannon, please tell us a little bit about the impact of bigotry um, that counselors should know on the indigenous peoples community, which of course is a very large community. Uh, good, uh, can you guys hear me, Isha? Uh, yes. All right, good. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's good to see everybody uh, in my language. They say, if you don't see anybody, then that's pretty bad. That's horrible. Hi, uh, Morocco. Uh, um, I work with her on a couple of community events there in uh, San Jose. So um, one of the things that I want to talk about really briefly, I know we only have a few minutes, but Native Americans or American Indians or indigenous peoples are some of the most misunderstood communities in the United States. Uh, if you can imagine uh, Native people, indigenous peoples once roamed that territory you were, and they still do, uh, but in less numbers. Uh, the Ohlone, the Miwok, the Mawekma, uh, in those territories where you're at in San Jose, Gilroy, San Francisco. Uh, unfortunately, California, because of the California Gold Rush, was one of the hardest hit communities along the coast uh, of the western, west coast of California. Uh, indigenous peoples were slaughtered and uh, they were hunted down. And so one of the things that there are several levels of bigotry and racism and biases that we face. And I think some of your students may be going through this. Uh, we have powwows now in the community. We have gatherings um, that are, uh, you know, people come by and they see what's going on. And it's a bunch of Indians screaming and yelling over there. Uh, my grandfather used to say, watch out, the Indians are getting riled up. And we used to laugh and we used to, we used to, say we're going to scare the white folks. I come from a reservation in Arizona. And so one of the biggest things that we face, I think, within our community is one is misunder being misunderstood. Secondly, is the policies that impact us as Native people. Uh, policies impact Native people were not allowed citizenship until 1924. Can you imagine this is your country and then all of a sudden they say, okay, now you're a citizen in 1924. Uh, 1960s was a big movement, the American Indian Movement, Black Panther Party, a lot of social justice movements, uh, which my, my uncles were a big part of. Um, as Native people, we face trauma and post-colonial stress disorder. Some of you call it PTSD, we call it post-colonial -post stress disorder, uh, because we are some of the most displaced, most uh, isolated, uh, most impoverished, most incarcerated, uh, so if you can imagine your high school students uh, or your students feeling some of these pressures within their community. Right now, one of the biggest things that's happening in our community is the finding of, first, the finding of 215 children in Canada uh, in the boarding schools. And remember, these missions that are all along the West Coast uh, have buried Indigenous peoples in those territories, Some, many of them with unmarked graves. Uh, and there are tons and tons and hundreds of boarding schools in the United States. So these conversations are happening inside native homes. And I can't imagine the stressors that these kids feel on top of all these other pressures that they're facing socially uh, with social media, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and whatever it is that they, they're more they're involved in. So identity is really critical. For us as native people, we constantly face this this backlash within the United States, right? Uh, we are environmentalist, uh, and you can see the environment burning around you, smell the fires from Sacramento and all up in the, uh, the area. There's a stewardship that happens with us where our relationship uh, with Mother Earth is different. The Amamutsin who take care of 
the land and the ecosystem up by the coastal area with Val and his group. Um, the, the political pressures, as I mentioned, but also the military, right? When they killed Osama bin Laden, they said uh, Geronimo, uh, has, uh, Geronimo has been killed, uh, right? So they use these terms. Uh, they say Apache helicopter, right? These are, or the Cherokee or whatever it is, these are names that are used constantly within, uh, within the U.S. systems and the, the, the other systems that we have. With regards to education, uh, education is so skewed that they like us in the 1800s. They like Native Americans. And I challenge you to Google all your staff when you get a minute and when you get a break is to Google Native American. And what you're going to find is that over 80% of those folks, uh, over 80% of us are back in the 1800s with the headdress on. And it doesn't represent us uh, well. So, so could you imagine if the native, if the kids start searching or do some research on uh, indigenous peoples or Native Americans, what it is that they're fighting, finding? Even could you imagine what it does to the native kids that's sitting there doing research on his own? So, so there's a lot of bases and a lot of uh, biases that we that we that we struggle with. Um, so I, I want to end there, but I, but I want you to understand that Native people are having a voice. We have Deb Holland in, in, as a Department of Interior Secretary. Uh, she's doing a great job. Uh, she's trying to confront all these uh, historical past and wrongs in the, that took, take place within the United States. But United States and you teachers and you counselors are so critical to the historical narrative. And you must, you must understand that what you're teaching uh, is 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 important, but but it also has a tinge of white supremacy. If you don't know about native people, why not? Why not? You're on their land, and most and and ninety point ninety nine point nine percent of the United States is on stolen it you know is stolen land. So let's be real. Let's let's be adults and let's have these hard conversations and let's talk about racism, bigotry, uh, because if we don't, uh, then we leave a legacy of turmoil and, and, and uh, continued trauma with our kids. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shannon, for going over that and for specifically commenting on the, you know, the general, um, the general understanding of, of, of the land that we all occupy and the importance of learning about the communities that we that we have replaced essentially in this area. Um, our next speaker is Joanna Lang. Uh, Joanna is a licensed marriage family marriage and family therapist and works for ACI, the Asian American uh, for Community Involvement Organization, as the Substance Use Treatment Services Program lead. She's born in the U.S. and raised in Hong Kong, but came to the U.S. around the age of twelve, and um, She's fluent in several different languages. Joanna, please shed light on the Asian, um, the issues of bigotry affecting the Asian American community. Thank you, Ishak, and hi everyone. I'm Joanna. Um, as Ishak kind of introduced me, I am born here in the United States, raised in Hong Kong, and came back when I was around 12 years old, and 12 or 13, maybe 13, and um, yeah, I think 13, and I started high school right away. So when I came here, one of the most common questions I get and, you know, when I whenever I meet someone new is, oh, where do you come from? And um, I usually say Hong Kong because I, I, even though I'm born here, I, I was born here and I stayed here until I was four or five years old. And, um, and then I went back to Hong Kong and in Hong Kong, I continued to learn English. That's why people are usually surprised. They're like, oh, you can actually speak English. And I'm like, yeah, we continue to learn English in Hong Kong. Just English is as important as Chinese. Um, what, growing up in Hong Kong, so I can speak and understand English um, quite well. And, and, and um, I think when I kept getting like, questions in school, I started asking everyone around me who look Asian the same question, oh, where do you come from? And I always get a very weird look, oh, I'm, I came from San Jose, or I, I came from LA. Um, and that I would feel kind of different. I'm like, oh, okay. So should I now tell people I'm from United States or I'm from Hong Kong? Um, and then I remember when I was in high school and I, I, 
it was my first year as a freshman and I was very nervous in class. I didn't really know anyone. So I didn't, didn't talk too much in class. Um, my English teacher decided to call the school counselor and said, hey, I need a, I have a student that needs your help. And can you, can I send her to your office? And the school counselor was like, yeah, sure. So I went to the counselor's office and he was like, oh, so, so what happened in class? I'm like, I'm not sure. I just got sent to you. And he called the English teacher and he put the phone on speaker and the, the English teacher said, well, you sent a student um, who doesn't speak English to my class. So I told him, no, I actually, I wouldn't tell the teacher because I, I was completely quiet in class. I think she assumed I did not speak English. Anyway, my um, school counselor asked if I would prefer to go to um, uh, ESL class. And at that time I was like, yeah, sure. I think, and, and I was able to make more friends in that class and felt more comfortable. So I think, um, for Asian American, it's very important for counselors to just be aware of um, that. You know, they they may look like they're um, we we look we are Asian, so we do look different. And and um, we a lot of us, even though those that are immigrated to the U.S., a lot of us do speak English. And especially for my generation, a lot of us do already learn English in um, our own our country. And, um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about model minority. So a stereotype that really contributes to the ongoing anti-Asian bias and hate is the mo model minority myth. The idea that Asian Americans are unilaterally successful and well adapted because we're quiet, submissive and hardworking. And because of this characteristics that we're labeled with being weak and we're often seen as the more vulnerable population and the ones that don't really say much, even though we're kind of being taken advantage of. And um, um, and this raises some can seen into the healthcare setting as well, where you know, nearly one in five practicing practitioners is of Asian descent. And according to a 2017 survey of 800 doctors in the US, 69% of Asian American doctors said that they endured bias, remarks, and personally offensive comments from patients. And unfortunately, these interactions are all too common. And you know, kind of after COVID-19, these comments could also even get worse. Um, I remember myself stepping out of an IEP meeting last March. Yeah, 2020 March. Um, I worked with the family that I've been, we connected pretty well. And I was the clinician at that time. I had um, also a, a two other co-workers with me together working with this family. Um, we sat, we walked out of the IEP meeting. Um, the mom and grandma were very happy and they're like, oh, just very happy the meeting, meeting, meeting was over, but they were shaking hands with everyone and said, thank you so much, thank you so much. And it was, when it was my turn, she said, hey, let's just do an air, air five, high five. And I was like, oh, okay, sure. But that was kind of, um, at that time, um, it was a uh, uh, belief that the virus kind of came from China. So at that time, I, I felt kind of um, sad that that was the reaction from the family. Um, but that also gave me the um, feeling that this is this needs to be more. Um, we need to stand up more for our our, um, our, our ethnicity group and kind of um, stand up for ourselves. And, and I understand at that time with social media and all the stuff going on with comments, making comments about the Chinese virus that the mom had that reaction. Um, and for a counselor to really, counselor to really be aware of um, self-control is a highly valued, highly valued um, thing among Asian American. So what um, self-control may be demonstrating by exercising poise and calmness in the face and of highly emotional experiences. So for students, sometimes um, Asian American students, especially the ones that were raised in Asian countries, it's, it's something that we've always been taught and told growing up that, you know, things that are not going well, we keep that to ourselves. We don't share that to other people. And especially when we talk about mental health in our own, in our, um, our culture, we, I remember my parents used to tell me, oh, no, don't say things like that. If I say, oh, I'm very depressed today, don't say things like that. You're fine. You have, you're, you're well fed. You have a place to live. You, you, don't, you won't feel depressed. And um, when, when we talked about, in, when I was in middle school, we would, 
we were around the age that we'll talk about um, things like, oh, I, I remember I had classmates that would cut too. And, and when we kind of talk about how we can support these classmates, teachers would tell us, oh, don't talk about that. And teachers would tell parents, that's not okay. They can't be cutting. And the parents won't really try to understand why this behavior is happening. They would just say, no, don't do that. Or hide your emotions. I don't care what you're going through. Just only show that you're doing okay. So yeah, that's pretty pretty much my own experience and some of the um, things I've seen growing up in Hong Kong. Thank you, Joanna, for sharing a little bit about that and for sharing some of your personal experiences as well um, in relation to you growing up in the United States. We'll now hear from uh, Brisa. Brisa. Uh, Brisa Camacho Lovell is a middle school Spanish teacher, eighth grade advisor, and social justice educator at Redwood Day School. Both in and out of the classroom, she enjoys uh, engaging with and learning from her middle schoolers around themes of equity and inclusion, and is ever so hopeful when hearing their perspectives on the surrounding world. Brisa, can you speak to the impact of bigotry on, in, in terms of what counselors should know on the Latinx community? Yeah, and again, um, thank you all for being here today. So, so much of what has been said um, by previous uh, participants is also applicable to the Latinx group, um, but I do want to clarify some terminology. So I use Latinx, I identify as Latina, because it's how I feel most identified, but Latinx refers to any person of Latin America, which includes Brazil, Haiti, and other non-Spanish speaking countries of the Americas, and the X indicates that it's inclusive of all gender identities. And this is important, it's important context for you all because Latinx is grouped into one monolith when discussed in politics, in the media, and it is not all one. Within this identity are people of all races and religions. That said, some people may identify as Hispanic, which is of Spanish origins, may identify as being from their country of origin, for instance, saying I'm just Mexican or I'm just Cuban and not identifying with any of these larger groups, or may identify as Chicanx, which is second, third generation Mexican-American. So you may have students who are from um, Guatemala, for instance, who speak mom more than Spanish, might be new to this country and are having to learn now both Spanish and English to survive. And this is a very different experience to someone who is Latinx but doesn't speak Spanish, maybe has Argentinian parents, for instance. Um, and also people have diverse family histories that have brought to them to your community. Not everyone has a recent immigration story, not everyone is fleeing, not everyone came to the country in the same way, but because of how much the immigration narrative as it relates to the Americas is dominated by imagery and news from the US-Mexico border, everyone might feel the weight of otherness and non-belonging that this narrative establishes. And for some, this is their experience and it is a trauma they may be carrying with them to school. Um, and so just kind of for context, um, I also wanna talk about language because in this country and um, in recent history, we have not allowed students to speak other languages. And this is true for other groups as well. Um, so there may be students whose parents don't speak English, um, but they don't speak Spanish, for instance. And they're not speaking Spanish can be a source of shame, can lead them to reject their cultural identity. And it's important to consider the messaging that students are getting from the school, from the larger community, from the government of this country, around what it means to be Spanish speaking or to speak another language. Um, likewise, for students who are bilingual, many times they get placed into remedial English classes or are placed into classes for students learning English, even as English might be a primary language. So there can be a lot of um, negative messaging around having a second language for students who also come from an identity versus for other students who don't come from Spanish speaking backgrounds, it's seen as like a boon or a way to get into college or a benefit to speak another language. Um, so it's really important to consider what messaging kids are getting around having second languages. Um, and also as a school, it's important to question how students are being placed. So who is being placed into advanced placement classes? Who is not? Are there trends? How is this impacting the identity of your students and um, what's the narrative that this may reinforce for all of the kids? 
another point I want to bring up is knowing that you all interact also with parents and families, it's important to consider that parents may not speak English and as a result might feel less welcome to participate in the school. Um, so the school can have indicator, indicators in school messaging, um, have someone who can speak with parents in their language in order to bring families in. For English speakers, we don't always acknowledge the privilege of speaking with the dominant language and how that is a ticket into conversations or to feelings of belonging. Um, and many families might not see that invite in because they don't see that this community values their language. They might not wanna be a burden and kids may be acting as translators for their parents or having to self advocate or even serve as a liaison between home and school. So that's an extra burden that a student may be carrying um, and feeling that their family is not valued in the school community. And I can go more into depth on all of these points in breakout rooms. But the final point I wanna add is that if students are undocumented, they may be carrying an extra level of shame. They may not be able to share with friends or to be fully honest or bring the full depth of their experience um, for security and safety reasons. And they may feel like they have to work harder than others to prove their worth. They might be carrying the trauma of being afraid of family separation, may have experienced family separation, and cannot discuss this openly. And this is all something that a student may be carrying with them as they're trying to show up in a school. Um, especially with DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals at Risk and being suspended in Texas recently, it may feel that students may be feeling that they do not have opportunities. And on top of that, they have to hear how they're presented in the media as illegal, bad people, et cetera. Um, so, I'm really excited to go more into depth in breakout rooms on this, um, but these are all things that I think it's important as counselors to take into consideration when interacting with students and families of um, Latinx identity groups. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Brisa, and especially for elaborating a little bit more on the ways in which language can exclude or you know, include certain communities over others. We're now gonna move on to Jessica Sterling. Jessica has held several leadership roles in the Jewish community, including board president of her synagogue sisterhood and currently serves as VP on the executive board of her synagogue in Oakland. Jessica manages interfaith community relations at the, or uh, Jessica's primary role is working with faith leaders and interfaith organizations and she participates in several Bay Area councils. Uh, councils. Jessica, please shed light on the important uh, things that counselors should know about the impact of bigotry on Jewish American communities. Thank you, Shock, and welcome. This is a lot of information, I realize, and, um, and a lot of listening. So, so thank you for all the listening that you're doing today. It's important work. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about Jewish students and parents and how they're affected. Um, they're greatly affected by anti-Semitism in their schools, within their schools, within the classrooms, within the walls of their schools. And we hear from both students and their parents when they reach out to their rabbi, and then they're referred to <clears throat> JCRC, which is Jewish Community Relations Council. Uh, during, <clears throat> excuse me, during COVID, anti-Semitism has been on the rise. And after the Israel-Palestinian conflict in May of this year, there was a noticeable uptick then too. At JCRC, we see anti-Semitism from the left and from the right. From the right, we see images of gas chambers and sweatshirts with Camp Auschwitz, which many might have seen uh, at the nation's capital takeover in January. And then from the left, we see Israel-related comments, which um, refer to anti-Zionist and anti-Israel. Jewish students are made to feel as outcasts and feel that no one is reaching out to them. Uh, they are held accountable for actions in Israel, although they may or may not have an interest or an opinion about events in this part of the world. Um, whereas in the past, college students would get this kind of um, bigotry and, and reaction it seems like now high school and middle school students are, are experiencing the same thing. So it's getting younger. Um, online bullying is rampant, primarily on TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat, and Twitter, 
and I speak with my daughters about that. I have a junior in high school in Oakland and um, she says she sees these comments on TikTok constantly and on, on the other uh, social um, platforms. Uh, my colleagues met with a group of San Francisco, <clears throat> excuse me, San Francisco high school students over a period of weeks. And they heard directly from them uh, how they feel, how they're affected, what's going on. Um, and Jewish students feel isolated. Uh, they say they're excluded from clubs if they say they're Jewish. Um, and also at times the students become the teachers of the situation. Um, they, and that is just a burden on them that they shouldn't have to carry. Uh, I'll share a couple recent examples of anti-Semitism in schools just to give you more clear picture of what, it, what the students are dealing with. Um, one is a high school sports team in Alameda School District posted a photo online of the team making the Hitler salute, which is very disturbing to the students. Um, students who are, you know, in sports or just the students who see them um, on campus day to day. Uh, and then a group in a Marin school district posted that Jewish student names were being collected on a list. Um, and then in San Francisco, a Chabad preschool, which is a, a Jewish preschool, was tagged with anti-Semitic graffiti on its outer walls, which frightened parents and families of like the youngest students. So um, you see there's, it's ongoing and constant. And these things like, especially graffiti, which is seen by both the Jewish community and the community where the buildings are. And we have seen anti-Semitic graffiti on the school, on that school, and um, also in high schools and middle schools and elementary schools, there will be swastikas that are reported. Um, there's also a large Israeli population in the South Bay and some parents feel the burden of having to carry the weight of the situation in Israel, so many miles away. And finally, um, I'll just conclude by saying that although many Jews are seen as white, there are about 15% of Jews of color and that number's growing. And these students identify with several communities and they feel the bigotry from all the communities. All the information that I just discussed as well as the previous panelists. So um, I will leave you with that. And I'm looking forward to meeting in breakout rooms to talk about how um, we can be supported. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica, for sharing, uh, shedding some light on the impact and the issues facing the Jewish American community. We're now gonna move on to our final panelist for this question. Before we move on to our second question. Uh, and so um, we'd like to hear from Nissa Sheikh. Nissa is the programs manager at Islamic Networks, Super ING, and has over 10 years of experience in the nonprofit sector, working with organizations that serve marginalized communities, both from a direct advocacy perspective advocacy perspective, sorry, as well as on the program management side. Uh, Nissa, can you please speak to the um, important uh, issues impacting the Muslim American community? Oh, you're on mute. Of course. Um, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, and thank you all for having us here today. Um, also, thank you to my wonderful co-panelists uh, for sharing their stories. Um, a quick background on me, I am half Pakistani, half Indian, and I've lived in the US since I was three years old. Um, Joanne, I wanted to thank you for sharing that story. It activated a similar memory for me. Um, when I was in kindergarten, I was actually, when I started, I was placed in ESL um, because it was assumed that I didn't speak English. I did speak English. Uh, my parents were both fluent. I was just very shy and I didn't speak much in general. Um, but I went through like three months of ESL before people noticed that I did speak English. Um, I was just in incredibly shy. Uh, so I wanted to sort of put that out there, that memory has stayed with me um, all this time. Um, Muslim Americans across the U.S. experience the bigotry that Maha discussed earlier, most commonly 
in what is known as Islamophobia. Islamophobia is defined as a fear of or bigotry against Muslims or those perceived to be Muslims. The impact of Islamophobia on Muslim students has been greatly overlooked. Muslim American youth are struggling with the bullying and prejudice that comes with Islamophobia, but they're also dealing with an identity crisis. The few major things that Muslim youth face today, um, I'll just go through a couple of things quickly. Um, as I mentioned, bullying and Islamophobia, a 2020 survey showed that 51% of Muslim parents reported that their child was bullied in school on account of their faith. This is nearly double the rate at which non-Muslim students are bullied, about 27%. In addition, in, in addition to the usual na name calling, hijab bullying, physically aggressive behavior, um, bullying on social media has now become very common. Muslim Americans are criticized relentlessly about their religion on the internet and on social media. The other, th the other challenge um, that Muslim American students face is not fitting in with their classmates. For many young people, the idea of fitting in with their classmates is really important, and this starts as early as kindergarten, maybe even earlier than that. Muslim Americans are aware of the fact that they look different, for example, um, young women that wear hijab, and they're restricted from certain social activities that are deemed normal, such as dating, school dances, overnight camping trips, um, and they're also aware that they're not celebrating the same holidays or having the same beliefs as their peers, for example, celebrating Christmas or Hanukkah. Students may sometimes feel that they carry dual identities between school and home, and this can be really isolating, especially um, for kids. A survey of San Francisco students found that 30% said that they don't want others to know that they're Muslim, and 15% said that sometimes they pretend not to be Muslim or wish that they could hide their identity. Um, some students may also have relatives or maybe immigrants themselves from countries that are in conflict and they carry that trauma with them due to the isolation they feel they may suffer through this silently. And along the same lines, at home, Muslim American youth face another challenge, which is having their families understand their problems whatever they're going through in that moment, whether it's bullying, um, their identity crisis, or even mental health issues such as depression. In some Muslim homes, topics such as depression and anxiety may be considered taboo. For example, they're raised to believe that they could always try harder, work harder, um, or pray harder to you know, move past their Ill illness. Um, and the last thing I wanted, uh, the last point I wanted to make was that, uh, was the physical effects of the psychological impact. Due to bullying and harassment, students may also suffer from difficulty sleeping, um, poor school adjustment, and all of, all of these things. I know that Sheila touched on this a little bit. Um, these things have been exacerbated by this pandemic. Um, that's all I'm going to speak to here, but I look forward to uh, talking to you all more uh, in the breakout sessions. Thank you. Great, thank you, Nissa. Okay, uh, we're now we we have a second question, which is a little bit more on the panelists to share, um, you know, specific things that counselors can keep in mind in terms of best practices when working with your community. And I've asked uh, panelists to limit their responses to around four minutes for that. And but before then, we're just going to take a one, you know, 30 second uh, pause uh, just to like digest a lot of the information we've heard so far. So I'm gonna set a timer for 30 seconds of silence and then we'll move on to the next question. Okay, um, we're now going to move on to our next question. Before we we go on to uh, into the breakout rooms, so I will ask: uh, Can uh, each of our panelists briefly speak to best practices for counselors working with your community? 
We're going to start with Sheila from the African American community. Um, hi again, thank you so much for listening to all this and really getting a sense of um, our diverse communities and the uniqueness and nuances of them all. Um, and so some of the things that, I, that um, I've got a chance to talk to a number of folks in the, um, the silo of care for young people in this community and a lot of the voices I spoke to were talking about really being aware of the holistic practice of seeing the whole whole child, the whole student, the whole person, and um, seeing them through the lens of trauma-informed, cultural, competent um, conversation. Um, that's one of the best practices, um, really trying to build relationship in the space with young people and seeing them um, for their, um, their uniqueness, but also for their cultural wealth. Um, a lot of things that Shannon was talking about, about the unique culture that um, his community has, and all of us have, <laughs> but I'm saying Shannon, because you just talked about the history in such a, 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 a powerful way. And just being conscious of the whole ideal of who that person is before you and the, the wealth of information that their culture brings into the space and really seeing that as an asset and not um, something to detract from. I think that's huge mostly for um, a space where anti-Blackness um, is pervasive in education and so really being conscious of challenging that narrative. Another best practice is um, moving toward welcoming um, families and welcoming students and welcoming caregivers because sometimes it's not the parents, it's a grandmother or it's a neighbor who really steps in and offers support to that student and really welcoming whoever shows up for that student in a really unique way. Another thing is to um, really acknowledge um, the different learning styles of um, children and how they engage in African-American children. But Joanna and Nisa said something that's really important, the ideal of being um, reserved, like students not wanting to participate and you being in a space where you're like, okay, this child might be in this space because of certain traumas or certain ideals of the situation and really saying, let me see what their learning style is. Are they more visual? Are they more, how, how can I adapt what I'm doing to, to their learning style and really make them feel welcome in this space. Another thing is reporting when there are problems. So reporting to, um, your, you are a man, man, um, mandatory reporter. So reporting when there are issues that are challenging this, the student and then um, working to build spaces of mental wellness. Um, that's a huge piece right now because there's been a large um, uptick in suicide and depression in the African-American community, and um, which had not existed um, previous to the last five years. And so being conscious of setting spaces that um, offer support, setting up spaces that welcome in community, that, um, that really embraces the diversity of the African-American community, and then moving to a space of trying to get understanding for yourself as you engage with them. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sheila, for shedding light on that. We'll now hear from Shannon to talk about best practices for counselors working with your community. Okay, Shannon? good, yeah, I'm here. I always start talking and then I forget I'm on mute. Um, so one of the things that, I mean, I'm old school. Uh, I don't know how many of you are as old school as me, but uh, one of the, the things that my grandpa used to do is he used to go and visit other communities. We don't do that enough, right? Uh, we're on constantly on Zoom or our Facebook. Uh, but when I go visit a community, uh, whether it's up north or down south or back on my reservation, I always take time. And it's one of the things that the children and the young and the native community like is that when you get to know them, uh, but don't try to don't try to educate them on their own history. Uh, and remember that a lot of native folks are coming from reservations or have been displaced. Um, so one of the things that you got to understand is that economic poverty on reservations has forced them to relocate to areas like San Francisco the Bay Area, um, uh, Los Angeles or Seattle or wherever they may go. And because of the economic situation on the community is they already are feeling that uh, level of isolation and ex uh, being excluded from certain things. Um, 
so for me, when I talk about when you're when you're dealing with our native community, is that learn the history, learn that historical trauma. It is extremely important that you know uh, that when you're addressing and you're dealing with the native community, is that specific history uh, in itself. It's a, if a child says, "I'm Lakota," well, what 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 band are they from? What area are they from? If they're Apache. What territory are they from? Are they from New Mexico or Arizona? Uh, take the time to really learn about that community. Know about the history. It's so critical and, and, and important. Uh, we as educators and as teachers and lecturers, uh, we have to know these things. Uh, if not, we become this kind of uh, this um, hegemonic, this, this, uh, this kind of teaching of just one style in learning. Learn about who we are, learn about what we've done, learn about how we contribute to this community and how we contribute to uh, the Bay Area, but learn mostly that uh, we are very, very family oriented and that we, um, we take pride in who we are and that uh, some of us uh, don't call ourselves an American. Uh, we are older than that concept. And so you, and, and so we're trying to get you to understand that it, our relationship with this country has been one of complexity, uh, of, of uh, a huge complexity, uh, uh, strife and difficulty. And so I think for you as, as professionals and as counselors is just to simply understand who we are, what we're, where we came from uh, and how our history uh, blend with one another. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Shannon, uh, for that. We um, will now move on to uh, Joanna. Joanna, can you shed some best practices for counselors working with your community? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone, again. Um, so I will share something based on my own experience as the counselor and experience as a student growing up. Um, I kind of talked about self-control earlier. Um, that, you know, Asian Americans is very, we're kind of um, always keeping emotions to ourselves and being very calm, no matter what happens, we try to do that. Um, and sometimes that can take longer for your students or clients to kind of open up in session. Maybe at the beginning, when you first receive a referral about a student going through some depressive or anxiety symptoms, and the student will come in, our client will come in telling you, no, I'm fine, I'm, I'm, I'm okay, not sure what you're talking about. So it will take some time for counselors to build the rapport with um, Asian Americans clients and, and then when they feel more comfortable and they can trust you, they could share more about what's really going on. But um, a lot of the times when I have Asian American clients, they would, you know, at the beginning, they don't really tell me much of what problems they're going through because they are just, um, just so used to keeping everything to themselves. And um, we always, we always make sure that their clients are very clear with um, limits of confidentiality. But with my um, Asian American clients, I really emphasize to them that um, unless anyone, or just unless anyone's at risk of being hurt or abused or neglect, we always would never share, never ever share what you talk about in session with your parents. Because a lot of the times um, our clients, Asian American students may think that, oh, everything is very connected to my parents. Everything's connected to my family. They will know whatever I talk about. And because in school, my, the, uh, my teachers will always tell my parents, well, at least for, for um, when I was in Hong Kong, teachers always communicate very closely to parents. So whatever happens in class, my parents will know right away. But I well, always want to make sure clients don't um, know that this is different with mental health. You, What you share in session will not be shared with uh, parents unless, certain things um, like, you know, at anyone has um, safety at risk or if the client gives you permission to share anything. And um, another thing I wanna talk about is that um, academic and occupational success is really come before mental health wellness, unfortunately for Asian American culture. So, um, well, since there's an interest with uh, and value of educational and occupational achievement exists, it, sometimes it's, um, in order to engage the parents into counseling, sometimes we uh, would bring up, oh, how we educate the parents, how mental health really benefits, uh, academic and occupational success really, really benefits from 
having good mental health. So that's something that um, helps me to engage parents in treatment a lot of the times um, when working with this population. Um, yeah, um, let me see if I went over everything. Yeah, and um, just the last quick, quick thing is that uh, we also focus a lot of psychoeducation for parents um, because parents, their responses directly impact clients' treatment progress. And especially for Asian American children, they're always expected to listen to their parents and obey the norms established by the family no matter what. So fam um, psychoeducation for caregivers, parents are a huge, huge part for um, counselors working with Asian American. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Joanna, for sharing such great information with all of us. Uh, we're now uh, go to Brisa. Brisa, can you share some best practices for counselors working with your community? Yeah, and um, I want to echo again, most of what Joanna just said is also applicable to this population. Um, so just kind of briefly, um, I would say extending an invite to families and establishing trust with parents and families um, or caregivers, whoever is at home, um, to not assume that any of these things are the case, uh, that assuming someone's legal status, assuming their ability to speak English, how they identify, um, and instead let students share what they need you to know. Um, I would also say that it's helpful to find out if there are other languages spoken at home and if families have point people in the school or feel welcome in the school community. Um, and finally, representation is so important. It's important that students see themselves reflected in the school at different levels. Um, there's honor in all jobs, and it's important that students only don't only see themselves reflected in the cleaning staff, for instance. Um, again, honor in all jobs, and kids need to see themselves at every level to know that they can be in any career, in any field um, that they desire. Um, and then finally, just remembering that this is an incredibly diverse identity group with diverse histories. So let students share and celebrate their identity in whatever way feels right and best for them. Um, so yeah, those are the points that I have to add. Thank you. Thank you, Brisa, for very succinctly shedding some more best practices. Uh, we'll now move to Jessica. Jessica, please, uh, if you don't mind shedding some light on this question. Thank you. Um, okay, so first of all, I would say listen. Listen to the students, listen to the parents. Um, don't use stereotypes as truths. Uh, not all Jewish families are wealthy. Uh, there is domestic violence present in the Jewish community. There's alcoholism and drug abuse, despite an impression that Jews don't drink or, you know, much. Um, also know that the Jewish community is strong and has a well, it does have a well-funded resource. However, not all Jewish families may choose to access it or use this. Um, ask how the students or parents can be supported. Um, also note, Jewish students don't always observe rituals, religious rituals or holidays the same. Um, there's great diversity in observance and including, um, including those who are just cultural Jews. Uh, finally, I'll just let you know there is a resource, which is a calendar of, of observance, which um, the JCRC, which is the Jewish Community Relations Council, does send out to all schools, to school um, superintendents, principals, school board presidents. And this is sent out twice a year. It's sent out by the San Francisco JCRC, as well as the Silicon Valley JCRC. Um, the San Francisco one has four years and Silicon Valley goes out seven years. So um, there's uh, a lot of lead time for those. Um, and we ask that schools don't um, hold important date, important events on these major dates, which students and staff may be absent for. For instance, um, back to school night or picture day where um, we've heard that there's been picture days on a holiday that's observed and young elementary school students who get the class picture are missing. So um, that's unfortunate. Uh, so 
these are ways that um, Jewish students can be supported. And I am going to paste into the chat actually a link to the calendar of, of observances, which can be used by uh, counselors um, for more understanding of this and also within the school. So if you want to share it with a student um, or a parent so they can share it with their school, uh, they can do that. And I'm also leaving in the chat the names of two people in the JCRC in the Bay Area and the Silicon Valley for further follow up after this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica, for sharing light and those resources. And we'll conclude this question with Nissa to talk about uh, best practices for working with the Muslim, Muslim teens and families. So there is definitely um, overlap in my suggestions with um, some of the things that the other panelists said. Um, there's a huge need for counseling services to be made available in the Muslim American communities. As I mentioned earlier, in some Muslim homes, counseling and discussion of mental health can be considered um, taboo. More and more young people are recognizing um, the need for mental health services, which is really amazing, but um, just be mindful that it is a shift in cultural norm. Um, other ways to support uh, Muslim American students can include becoming as educated about Muslim issues. Um, as Muslim students, uh, having biased opinion, they may be resistant to opening up because of their like past experiences. Um, and, and also note that Muslims are very diverse. They come from many different cultural backgrounds um, and have different traditions and ways of practice. So you may have one student who's more conservative than another and their views on religion will be vastly different. Um, the next point would be um, to allow the students to tell you about their religion culture if they feel comfortable doing so. Um, this just helps them to feel heard, builds trust, and also helps them process some of their issues just by saying it out loud. Um, this will also help you problem solve with the students. So they might come to you with um, trying to figure out how to take breaks during Ramadan if they're fasting. Um, also keep in mind that some students don't wanna be put in the position or they're shy to educate and explain themselves and they may not be, they may not want to, or they may not be ready to do that. Um, providing students uh, with ways that they can connect with other Muslim students, but also students from other cultures and religions that may be experiencing the same kinds of issues as them. Many kids will gain comfort hearing from other kids who are experiencing the same kind of challenges they are. Um, and last, I just wanna turn my attention um, to parents in Muslim American households because they may be struggling as well um, with, with the same kinds of issues. And this directly impacts the kids as well. Um, immigrant parents may be unfamiliar with how things in school work. They may not be as involved in PTA and other school activities or in supporting their students academically. Um, they just may not have the resources um, or know sort of what to do. Muslim Americans may feel embarrassed or uncomfortable, um, and it may be helpful to work with the parents to see if they want to meet to discuss better ways to support the student and um, provide resources. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Nissa, for um, closing us out on that question. So thank you to all of our panelists who have shed light first and foremost on the issues impacting their communities. And second, what are things counselors can do to respond to these, um, to these issues and to best serve uh, you know, their students of these backgrounds. Um, we're gonna go ahead and stop the recording before we move into our breakout session, which I will explain. So I'm gonna stop.